So welcome to this uh, IRSI webinar, the IRSI Web Clinics. Uh, this is the first in a series of endeavors from the Intraocular Implant and Retractive Society of India. And uh, we will be having a few webinars uh, down the line. Today's webinar is uh, an interesting uh, ophthalmic debate where we will be discussing with some top uh, you know, faculty from all over the country. And we have some of the top names here from uh, IRSI and from uh, AIOS and other uh, uh, members as well. And uh, we will be, I would like to now introduce the program for today. I'll first, uh, I'll be sharing my uh, screen uh, with uh, you over here. And uh, so this is our, the big standoff. It's the ophthalmic uh, debates from the IRSI. And uh, everybody has been attending the IRSI meeting. They're well attended. So today we have a, a nice panel. We have the gunslingers, the panelists who are the top shots of IRSI. We have with us Dr. G.S. Dhami who is the president of the IRSI and uh, he's director of Dhamia Institute in Ludhiana, Punjab. Professor Amar Agarwal, everybody knows him. He's uh, omnipresent in ophthalmology, secretary general of the IRSI. He has been uh, instrumental in bringing IRSI to where we stand today. We have Professor Maipal Sajde, who is our uh, AIS president and the chairman scientific committee of uh, IRSI. And uh, he's chairman and managing director of the Center for Sight Group. Uh, he's not a stranger to any of us. Uh, he's again, one of our most dynamic uh, eye surgeons. And then we have our star contestants and they will be having a shootout amongst themselves. Uh, let me show you the situations that we are going to be presenting to you today. Uh, the first case discussed will be which IOL will you prefer for your own cataract surgery? So we will have Dr. Partha Biswas, who is director of BPI Foundation Kolkata. And he will be speaking uh, against uh, Dr. Kumar Doctor, who is uh, CEO of Dr. I Institute in Mumbai. Again, one of the old uh, IRSI top members and not old, but one of the youngest ones. And then we have uh, the second situation, which we will discuss uh, today. Uh, these Each participant is going to get five minutes to present, and then we'll have a panel discussion and time for an audience poll as well. I'll be guiding you as we go. Uh, will you choose FLAX or FACO for your own cataract surgery? And here fighting out will be Dr. Harshul Tuck from Ravatai Hospital, Jaipur, also a member of the ARC from AIOS, uh, and Dr. Sonu Goel, director of the Anandai Hospital in uh, Jaipur, again, a member scientific committee of the AIOS and an active member of IRSI as well. The next situation, which again will be fought out well and which fits into the current times and all of us are thinking about it. Should we start our cataract OTs right after the COVID lockdown opens? And here fighting it out between the two of them will be Dr. Sri Ganesh, chairman of the Nitil Dhamma Super Speciality Eye Hospital in Bangalore one of our most dynamic uh, RSI members against uh, Dr. Chitra Ramamurthy, mm -hmm. who's director of the Eye mm -hmm. Foundation, Coimbatore. I'll request others to... Thanks. Dr. Chitra Ramamurthy, who's the chairman ARC of AIOS, and they will be fighting it out on the post-COVID lockdown, the cataract OTs. And then we have one of the most uh, important debates mm -hmm. for the day and some of the best uh, you know, people fighting it out. Your daughter, 23 years old, six diopters of stable myopia with a healthy cornea, wants refractive surgery. What are you going to choose? Will it be LASIK, SMILE, or surface ablation? And fighting it out, Professor Namrata Sharma, again, who has been instrumental in bringing AIOS to the level where it is today, General Secretary and Professor of the RP Center, Ames, New Delhi, General Secretary of the AIOS, against uh, Dr. Rupal Shah, who is one of the pioneers of SMILE surgery. She is Group Medical Director of the Center for Side Group of Hospitals and, uh, and based out of Vadodara. Again, no stranger to everyone. And Dr. Virinder Agarwal, who is director of the Dr. Virinder Laser Center in Jaipur, was the organizer of the IOS meeting, which was very successfully fought in Jaipur. So I think uh, we have a nice situation set up. Let me bring our panelists on board. And uh, can we have uh, Dr. Dhami, Dr. Maipal, and Dr. Amar on screen, please? Can we have them on their mics as well? Uh, do we have Dr. Maipal, Dr. Amar, yeah. and Dr. Dhami online? Yes, sure. sir, Gaurav. Sure. Yeah, Gaurav. Wonderful. Welcome, sir. Welcome, uh, Dr. Amar, uh, Dr. Dhami, uh, Dr. Maipal. So, sirs, can we, would you like to say something before we kick off with the first situation? Uh, would you like to introduce the seminar? Well, I, uh, I think, uh, uh, welcome to this IIR SI seminar. I think this is uh, essentially uh, a debate format that we are going to do. And Gaurav has been doing this for a lot of time, and I think it is one of the most popular sessions that has been there whenever we have done the IIRSI uh, conferences. Uh, so therefore, we thought that this should be the first uh, topic that we should pick up and uh, Gaurav has meticulously planned it and uh, obviously there are these relevant topics that he has picked up. 
so we will uh, without much ado i think uh, we will have the participants uh, give their views so as gaurav has said 5 5 minutes for each participant and then you can post in your questions and also he'll ask as to which participant you thought spoke better so i think uh, without much ado he has already introduced the topic let's go on and uh, uh, let's have an enjoyable session today thanks dr maipal dr amar one word quick and i then think we'll uh, what gaurav has basically uh, done here is phenomenal to get so many people together just so that we can educate all and i have to give full credit only to one person here in gaurav and also his team jaswinder and the entire team who backed him so much congrats gaurav thank you sir dr dhami one quick word and then we go on to our presentation gaurav you have perfect questions so we answered let's go through thank you sir so can we have uh, the first uh, contestant dr partha biswas uh, none other than the chairman scientific committee ios coming on with uh, his question uh, can we dr partha can you upload your a uh, presentation please yes yeah wonderful sure. welcome thank you very much gaurav uh, i'll start my presentation and i'll share the slides dr partha will be speaking on which iol he is going to plan for his own cataract surgery so gaurav uh, which iol would i plan for my own cataract surgery yes when it happens and i'm waiting for it to happen it is going to be trifocal iol and nothing else if i had to have my cataract surgery done now it would be the trifocal why have you ever seen these gentlemen with glasses i'm sure you have not and possibly you will never see in them for the rest of the times have cataracts they must no and i'm sure it's trifocals that they use because they can read they can watch the tv they can be on the screen and they can watch the distance the beautiful distance uh, is there for them to see i always thought about bladeless lasik but that was too late and bladeless lasik was not for me i was in my press bar package and therefore i need to be off these thick glasses at one point of time and do everything myself without the glasses so what do we have in this trifocal and the advantage of seeing the distance the intermediate and the near and the great chance of being spectacle free is what i'm going to look for and these covid times believe me all these household chores i don't want to cut my fingers but i want to read and i want to watch the screen as much as possible and i don't want to change my comfortable posture at all so why try focal well it improves the intermediate uh, uh, vision with a very specific foci it does not impair the near and the far vision over the existing diffractive multifocal designs and it favors a distance vision in the mesopic condition it provides a vision range from 33 cm to 100 cm along with the distance and it reduces the side effects of night vision problem halos and glare now look at what dr kumar is going to say does he have any study there's only one meager one from jcrs and that also in march 2020 in which 40 patients with ati's were compared with technis one with eye hands only intermediate vision was better and monocular and binocular uncorrected and corrected distance vision was similar in both groups the near vision of course they had to wear correction but i want no glasses if kumar wishes to have glasses for his near that's his choice but it's not mine at all and both eye hands and eye drops lenses give some amount of compromised near visual equity and you need to wear glasses for the near vision that absolutely is not my choice so we uh, have a small video and this is what i would like to have in my eyes of femto cataract surgery sextens and uh, and a trifocal iol is what i would want and uh, that's it but let's look at what we have given to our patients over all this time and this is uh, 48 eyes of our patients which we evaluated and uh, this is what we found out 
only 4% of these patients required spectacle correction for distance and intermediate vision. 6% patients needed spectacle to read. 98% patients answered yes when they were asked whether they would go in for an implant of a trifocal again. And if we can give the best to our patients, so that's the best for ourselves. And that's my choice, freedom from glasses. Thank you very much for your patient hearing. Thank you, Gaurav. Uh, thanks a lot, Dr. Partha. And now we'll quickly go on to our next uh, counter view from uh, Dr. Kumar, doctor, who is going to choose a different lens for his surgery and he'll tell us why, and then we'll have a panel discussion. So Dr. Uh, Kumar, can you? So can the admin switch on the video for Dr. Kumar, please? Yes, we can see you now and you can upload your presentation. Five minutes, Dr. Kumar. And for the audience, uh, please remember that once Dr. Kumar finishes his presentation, you have the option of sending in what you think who was the winner between the two, whether you, whether you feel the trifocal lens or the lens that Dr. Kumar is going to talk about is the winner. And we will be finishing off with the poll after the discussion finishes and we'll tell who, win the, who won the debate. So please uh, be ready to vote right after Dr. Kumar finishes in the comment section on the where you have logged in either on Facebook or on Swarnam. Thank you. Can I start? Yes, please. Go ahead. Uh, thank you, everyone. Uh, so the question here is, what would I prefer as an IOL for myself? And I wonder that is this a debate between a diffractive trifocal or an extended depth of field of IOL? And I'm really surprised and shocked as to this really is a debate anymore because I don't think it's a debate. According to me, trifocals compromise the quality of vision because it gives glare, halos, and contrast loss. So what we know is good quality vision, ability to be able to see in low contrast and yet give 20-20 to our patients is good quality vision. But patients with trifocals will have glare and halos. Look at this uh, that is there, the glare and halos patients are going to be unhappy, quality of image patients are going to get confused, the combination of two, there'll be a loss of contrast and the patient is going to get unhappy. The halos can be mild to severe and here there is another image which we can see very well on the right hand side where there is a back side of the uh, a car which you can see the light is much more spread out in a multifocal or a trifocal IOL but in an EDOF lens it's not that spread out. Imagine a trifocal IOL decenters. If it decenters, patient loses the best quality distance and the best quality near. And the patient will need either an explantation or a re-implantation etc. So this is a decenter trifocal IOL and these patients are going IOL basically means a compromise in terms of quality of vision and so on a happy patient. What am I going to prefer for my eye? I'm going to have a technis IHANS IOL. The anatomy or the geometry of the lens is the same as the technis one, which is well proven. We will give 2020 to ourselves and improved intermediate vision. What else is the benefit? No ring, no zones, no halo, so no dysphotopsia. It's the same asphericity. The sharp quality of vision because of the asphericity and the most important is the material which is a chromatic abrasion which gives better contrast is just like what you are 20 years of age and no glistening so this is not an issue at all. Four months back my choice for myself was a symphony IOL with micro monovision with having a minus half in the non-dominant eye and I was getting N6 with this for my patients but with the eye hands coming in I prefer the eye hands the main reasons will go into details. So I've done a lot of patients post-refractive, given them symphony and patients are very happy. The biggest advantage these patients have had is no loss of contrast. There are halos, there is a star bus, but with this, I've now shifted these patients to eye hearts. There is a possibility, as rightly mentioned, of doing a mix and match. If the, if the patient or myself, if I really want to I have N6, I can have eye hands in one eye and symphony in the other eye. Both do not reduce contrast and this is quite possible. Talking of a small series that is presented by Partha, I myself have data of 125 patients uh, done. 90, 89% were 6.9 binocular and 11 were 6 by 6 part. But the beauty is, yes, you will need 75% of your patients with an ad of 1.25. The 18% the 18, 7% of my patients needed no ad at all. So in IHANS also it can happen that the patients don't need ad at all. Some of them may need a 1.5 ad. Trifocals basically means compromise of vision. There are two studies which I will show. A study in 19, uh, 2019 and 2020, 20, just one few months back. Again, this is done between the Acrisoft Panoptic as well as the EDOF lens, as well as the trifocal lens. And what was found? 
this patient basically had a personality trained analysis and they were found to have that yes you have a big choice of multifocus to give to our patients or to ourselves but it's very important to understand the personality of the patient these patients did have a reduction in contrast there is no doubt about it the patient's dissatisfaction came because of halos it was also proven in the study that patients with panoptics or the trifocals had to have neuroadaptation and neuroadaptation was entirely dependent on the type of iol and the psyche of the patient and that's the reason why it's very 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 patient dependent and all of these problems are sorted out in an edof ihans iol another study in 2020 just few months back again trifocal and acrylisa which was a fiz iol iol here it was very important and stressed out that this patient's psychology has to be analyzed and if these patients were unhappy or dissatisfied it was because of the photopic phenomena so these patients were unhappy and because of that these and those in summary who wants today's world night driving problems loss of contrast complementary glare and halos and starbursts and if it decenters you have to reexplant explant and reimplant etc 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 so as my personal thought is friends and seniors if it was your own eye and me for my eye what is the confusion why would we want to do this to our patients or to our own eye as far as i am concerned i am completely sorted look at this examination of patient writing prescription no glasses seeing a movie on ipad no glasses mobile no glasses email no glasses whatsapp no glasses doing my photography eating my lunch or dinner and playing music and instruments no glasses driving in the night no glasses i can see my dashboard quite easily i'm operating on my uh, operation theater i can see the trolley without glasses if i buy a 3d microscope i won't need glasses and if you want to really read, need glasses in an eye hans you will need to gla have glasses in the stock exchange to read the stock price or to read the newspaper which is 30 minutes in a day but mind you friends with the lockdown the newspaper also comes on my ipad and i don't need glasses anymore so that 30 minutes in a day for this need for glasses is completely gone so what would i prefer for my own eye and lens called eye hans or any edof lens which gives no loss of glare no contrast loss no halos uh, this is what i would prefer for my own eye and i would prefer for my own patients thank you all for your attention thanks dr kumar and uh, for that nice presentation now we have lots of questions coming in and uh, for my panelists you know i have a few questions the first one is that uh, do trifocal lenses has any eye surgeon yet got a trifocal lens himself or herself and have they shared and do they have a problem in contrast because they have to do microscopic surgery dr maipal sir would you like to answer this i have operated several uh, eye surgeons but uh, i have actually not implanted uh, uh, any uh, trifocal or a multifocal lens in any of these uh, i have implanted in cardiac surgeons uh, three cardiac surgeons actually the eye hands lens and uh, they are reasonably good because they were looking at uh, uh, obviously doing their angioplasties and things like that they are uh, one of the couple of them are the most leading uh, are the leading invasive cardiologists in india so i personally have uh, still not gathered the courage to go on because earlier we did uh, uh, one or two bifocals but then uh, the trifocals have come in over the last one one and a half year but suffice to also say that from a patient perspective the amount of dysphotopsia and the problems that the patients are having with trifocals is much much less i am still waiting to lay my hands so i have done only two eyes of uh, a combination of edof with a trifocal which is uh, going to be introduced soon in india so let's see whether the uh, dysphotopsia etc totally go or not but i think uh, the multifocal lenses are dead and buried multifocal as uh, what i mean is the bifocal lens uh the edof has uh, as of now i think the eye hands or the edof uh, lenses would possibly be the best lenses uh, with the least amount of dysphotopsia but i think sooner or later there will be ophthalmologists who will go ahead and get trifocals put in their eyes uh there are people i think uh, uh, there are two three ophthalmologists who have got uh, uh, panoptics lens put in their own eyes Uh, i have not uh, had personal discussion with them but one of the leading ophthalmologist uh, as uh, one put in bombay through his son and uh, another one also through his son in delhi so i don't know if any one of you have spoken to them as to how they feel about it but there are few of them who have got uh, the trifocal uh, lens in their own eyes but personally i haven't done that thanks sir, dr maipal sir and uh, dr
I think we are losing the audio of Gaurav. Dr. Yeah. Thami, you wish to say something on uh, uh, what would Amit. your choice be for an ophthalmic surgeon? Ourself. I think uh, my first choice would be an eye henna lens. But I have an experience of an eye surgeon having a trifocal. And he virtually describes how he felt when he was doing a distant direct retinoscopy. He said, I see circles, but I, my mind just forgets them. So he was very comfortable operating and doing everything. He is one of the renowned eye surgeons, but I feel eye enhance would have been a better choice. Gaurav? Yes. Gaurav, one thing I want to say, I like the sentence which Mahipal has said, which I think is a message which everyone should take is the multifocals are dead and buried, you know. Now, whether you choose the symphony, the edofs, or you choose the trifocal, definitely at least we don't prefer to use the multifocals as Mahipal very correctly said. You know, so you can go for the trifocal or for the... Uh, extended depth of focus mm -hmm. lenses. These both have good combinations. I think both are things. We are very happy with the trifocals, to be honest to you. But I think the multifocals are a problem. Right. So, you know, what I've understood is that the case selection has to be good because both the lenses offer excellent stuff, the trifocals and the eye hands, uh, which I've used in good numbers. And uh, there's a question for Dr. Kumar which uh, one of the audience, uh, one of the listeners, uh, does it tolerate astigmatism less better than the multifocals, number one? And number two, do you leave a micro monovision when you do two eyes, like leaving the non-dominant eye with a minus 0 0.5? Kumar, would you like to answer that? Yeah, you can hear me, Gaurav? Yes. So I have, I do micro monovision in all my eye hands patients. Uh, three of my patients are extremely unhappy with eye hands. The main reason being astigmatism that came into the surgery. Now, I don't know really where it's come from. After that, we had a lockdown. But today, eye hands is not available in toric form. They are going to introduce this in the next few months to come. So, 100% it will come. So, if a patient with eye hands is unhappy, look for toricity. It's not your surgery. It's not the lens. It's not a decentered lens. It is your toricity which is making the patient unhappy. But if you give that astigmatism, the patient is extremely happy. I intend to correct that astigmatism for that patient immediately by surgery. That's a laser surface treatment. And I can manage this quite easily. But whatever number of series, one more thing I want to add, of course, this is for ophthalmic uh, surgery, but I want to tell the panelists also that if you are a diamond merchant and if you are a watch repairer, this is an ideal lens because there is no reflections coming from anywhere. So if you have to see diamonds with a eyepiece, this is a very good lens to have. I have not put a multifocal in any diamond merchant's eye, but this is what I thought that this is an ideal lens to have because there are no reflections, there's no glare, there's no halo, no reflection coming from the light that they see the diamond. So that's Omar, just a question for you. Uh, are you aware of the MTF function with an eye hands lens? Uh, is it as good as a normal uh, monofocal lens? Or yes, there is a degradation in the MTF? No, it's the same as a technus. No, I think uh, you need to go to the eye trace. I think you have an eye trace and just see the MTF uh, uh, function vis-a-vis -vis the eye hand versus the monofocal. There is about 20 to 25 percent degradation in the MTF. Just, uh, I think you have an eye trace. If you have, just uh, just go ahead and do that. Uh, there is a comment, uh, Gaurav, which has come from Dr. Suresh Pandey from Kota. He says, I have implanted trifocal IULs in 10 doctors, surgeon, orthopedic surgeons and physicians, including one eye surgeon. They are all very happy. So, Dr. Uh, Suresh Pandey uh, has uh, this thought uh, regarding trifocals. You know, so it all depends upon what you have most experience with sometimes, uh, Dr. Maipal. And I think uh, we'll, uh, you know, we have time for one more question. You're absolutely right. I think both have excellent. I have also a lot of satisfied patients with both uh, trifocals and with eye hands. Uh, there's a quick question. One is that uh, do trifocals have significantly more glare and halos than the bifocals or less than that? And number two, if maybe you can answer this for posterior segment surgery that uh, would you have difficulty if there was a trifocal aisle in place if you were to do a posterior segment surgery for somebody who has a trifocal lens these both these questions very briefly yeah uh, well uh, trifocals uh, in for uh, the posterior segment a patient with posterior segment surgery definitely it has to be well assessed if the patient is extremely keen then only because the chance of a the trifocality being a little low because of the uh, position of the lens might be a, a compromise. So only if the patient has had a trifocal in the other eye, should you go in for a trifocal in this eye. Otherwise, if it is a dive patient with the first eye and a, a vitreous surgery has been done, best not to go in for a trifocal. The other thing is I do have um, uh, three patients who have had an extended depth of vision uh, 
IOL in one eye and the trifocal in the other eye. So between uh, for these three patients, I asked them if they were to compare. Of course, they were told before the surgery that this is going to be the case. So if when they compared one eye to the other, they said that though the contrast sensitivity was a little less, but they were happier with the combination. And uh, if I, when asked that, would I go in for a trifocal in the other eye? The most uh, two patients said they would go for the trifocal in the other eye as well, if given a choice. One okay, thanks, Partha. Yeah. Thanks, Partha. And now I request Dr. Amar to uh, sum up this uh, debate so that we can quickly go on to the next one. I think both Partha and Kumar have spoken extremely well. And I think you can choose trifocal or an eye hands, extended depth, anything which you want, whichever you're comfortable with. Both give very, very good results. And I have to congratulate both of them for speaking so well, explaining to everybody all the points which are there. Thanks a lot, Dr. Amar. We had lots of more questions which we couldn't take. We'll probably take it towards the end when we go to the panel discussion. Now for the poll that we had. Now the amazing thing is we have almost close to 130 or 140 votes which have come in. And in it was uh, I hands which was taking the cake completely. And then later on, somehow Dr. Partha's supporters have uh, pulled in as well. <laughs> we have almost an equal split. And that's exactly what I want to convey. Yeah, you know, each person is voting five lenses. times. Some of them, yes. This but, is all right. uh, uh, each person is voting my, five times. Yeah, my daughter <laughs> is helping me. She's an ophthalmologist. She's keenly following all the results. As well. And uh, we've kind of seen that it's an almost 50 50. So I think that's the take home message is that uh, both eyes are amazing uh, if you choose your cases right. And, uh, you know, that's the key. Let's quickly go on to the next one if everybody agrees. Thanks a lot, Dr. Partha and Dr. Kumar. Stay till the end for the final panel discussion. We my now Partha, request our next speaker. And uh, <laughs> we'll have the next speaker. Please link in. Uh, do, you have, do you have Dr. Harshul and uh, Dr. Sonu Goyal? And they are going to talk about whether, you know, they would uh, care for a uh, flax or a uh, 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 FACO surgery for their own cataract surgery if they were going to opt for one. I think we have Dr. Harshul Tuck first and I'll request Dr. Harshul to come online. I'll switch on your video and audio, please. And uh, please upload your presentation. Let's see uh, what Dr. Harshul would want. Does he want a laser-assisted cataract surgery or will he go for a FACO surgery? Harshul, please make your point in five minutes. Thank you. Yeah. Can you hear me, Dr. Gaurav? Yeah. Yes, yes, yes. Please share your screen. Yeah, so uh, at the yeah. outset, thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Gaurav, for uh, inviting me. And it's a great pleasure to be uh, on the webinar of IRSI. So I'll be speaking on what will I choose for my own eyes. Can you see my screen? No, dear. Hello. Can you see my screen now? It came no. for a time, but now it's gone again. So can you please put it back? Yeah, yeah, just hold on. <clears throat> yeah. Can you see it now? Are you able to see my screen now? Yeah. Yes, uh, Harshal. Finally. Yeah, can I go ahead? Yes, please go ahead, Harshal. Uh, so, uh, I think the technique of choice for my own cataract surgery will be undoubtedly FACO. Because I believe in this uh, technology and uh, FACO is the gold standard nowadays because the, all the surgeons have become highly skilled over the years. Gastrorex is the key for the effective position of the IOL, we all know. And uh, we all have become so much skillful that we can uh, make a perfect Gastrorex is almost all of the time which perfectly overlap the IOL optic all around, which is a key for all the premium miles which we use nowadays, multifocals, trifocals, or read-off lens, or ions lens. And we are in the era when we have perfected everything from biometry to our incisions to OVD. From the, from the, we have better FICO machines which have power modulations and which delivers very less energy in the eye. So our cataract surgery has become very safer and we have very faster visual recovery, and it is a, we all know it's a daycare surgery. So my choice is, of course, FACO, because that's what I believe in 
I, I do in all my patients and I believe that I'll undergo this surgery only from one of my uh, skillful surgeon friends which are there all around India. So why I don't want flex because is the new technique, it, 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 was, uh, it came in 2010 when it was first approved by US FDA. We all expected that this new technique will be faster, easier, safer, less complicated, and it will become available to wide variety of people. But it's a step in the wrong direction. It is slower, it, is, it takes longer time, complications are same, results are not superior, and patients don't like it much, as well as doctors don't like it because there is uh, a lot of money involved in this. At what cost? I'll tell you with all this literature. So this is the American Academy website which says that laser cataract surgery, what does it have to offer? It says that laser surgery doesn't have anything more to offer. There are no fewer complications. It doesn't quite better outcomes as compared to the conventional phase for surgery. And your outcome depends largely on the skill and experience of your surgeon. This is the Cochrane Library study which compared 16 randomized controlled trials. And it clearly showed that 11 studies out of 16 these randomized controlled trials, they were all unclear or high risk of bias because authors had some financial uh, interest in the laser platform they studied. In spite of all those financial bias and all these things, the studies no study proved superiority of femtolaser over conventional FACO in terms of visual or refractive outcome or endothelial cell loss or the uh, corneal incision or all those things. So let's see this study in the Lancet, which also compared femtosecond laser with conventional FACO. And it said, despite its advanced technology, femtosecond laser is not superior to conventional FACO in cataract surgery and with higher cost, it did not provide an additional benefit for FACO for patient or for healthcare system. Another study which proves that this was a very big study done by Sonia Manning and Peter Berry from ESCRS registry, and they studied 2,800 femto cases with 5,000 conventional FACO cases, and they conclude that femto laser did not yield better visual or refractive outcomes and intraoperative complications were similar and low in both the groups. So what does this femtocatech offer? Let's see the capsulotomy with the femto machine people they boast of. This is a latest study by Shiraz there in BGO, which shows that the capsulorex, is, it is in fact the femto capsulorex is not a capsulorex, it's a capsulotomy. It's a postage stamp like capsulotomy, which is very weak. And this study proves that that this, the femtosecond laser assisted capsulotomy is weakest as compared to the uh, manual CCC or the selective laser capsulotomy CCC. This is another study published in ARVO which showed that the, the other one is the manual capsulorexis, which is very strong and which is very smooth. And the lower one is the femtosecond laser scanning electron microscope photograph, which showed that the, it, it was irregular and it was weaker. Again, the same photograph. So when we see the effect of the IL tilt and decentration in normal FACO cases, the studies are there which shows that up to 0.4 millimeter of decentration and tilt of five degrees tolerated for aspheric IOL. And routinely we don't get a decentration of more than 0.28 to 0.3 millimeter. So there is no obvious advantage of femto capsulorexis if we compare with the conventional FACO. This is the Peter graph which also showed the effect of, uh, there, is a, there is a minimal effect on the modulation transfer function if we see the decentration and tilt of the IOL. Okay, so the Harshil, can you summarize this? Studies which compared with the stem. Yeah, 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 yeah. So if we see the incision also, it doesn't give any advantage and there are, of course, complications of femtolaser. There is a huge financial burden on doctor as well as patient. And it has its unique challenging, uh, it has unique complication of femto. There are various studies which, prove, which are not able to prove any superiority of femto over this. So I think femto platform right now is, for me, it's a white elephant, meaning 
you need to invest a, a, a huge uh, uh, like money on this three to four crores, and after that you need to pay CMC, and after that you need to pay per user fee. So in this time when economy is going down, nobody can afford this. So till date, I think Femto Cataract seems to be a case of Empress new clothes. So for me and for my patients, I prefer conventional FACO. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Harshal. And uh, now we'll have our next. Surgeon, and he has decided to choose laser cataract surgery for himself. And uh, I'll request, and you can start sending in your votes as soon as Dr. Sonu Goel finishes on whether you would choose a femto assisted surgery or a FACO surgery for your own eye. Uh, Dr. Sonu, please uh, go ahead and uh, you can uplink your uh, presentation. Gaurav, uh, I think uh, there are a lot of questions coming. People are asking how to vote. How to vote? Or oh, they have to write uh, whom they agree with. Like they saying that, uh, you know, for the particular situation, like if they think that Femto is the way to go, they'll vote for Femto. They can write in the comment section on the Swarnin Live or on the Facebook Live, they can put the comment. And if they agree with the other speaker, if they think that FACO is the way to go, they can write down FACO. So basically, they have to go to the question answer session and write uh, in the question answer FACO or for Femto, right? Through the discussion part and we'll announce the result at the end of the discussion. And you can start voting as soon as Dr. Sonu Goel has spoken. Gaurav, they are asking you how to vote. Yes, sir. So, so they, are, they can ask their questions on the question answer session as well on the comment section. And their vote is also on that section itself. If they just write uh, flags, we will like, understand that they are voting for flags. Yeah, so basically, they have to go to question answer session, Gaurav, and then yes. they have to just write flags or fake. They have to write. Yes, yeah. absolutely. So there is no voting as such that they have to write flags or fake. Yeah, Sonu, you can start, please. No, 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 no. Is my uh, slide visible, sir? Yes. yes. Oh, yes. Okay. So, very good evening. I hope you have understood what FACO stands for. Why flex? This is review of ophthalmology and from the words of Jeffrey Morris, Sherry Rowan, and partially Dr. Ramar Agarwal. I haven't met a surgeon yet who wouldn't want the femto laser used if they had cataract surgery themselves, whether or not they use the laser in their own practices. Now, I think that itself is very telling. It's all about evolution. The human race has evolved, and we all have evolved from the extracapsular, SICS, FACO, and now it is all about flex. World over, 47.8% blindness is cataract, and 80% Indian blindness is cataract. Now, this is a small article published in the IGO, where if you see the cataract variety, almost 20% of the Indian cataract is hypermature white cataracts, 20% is the nuclear cataract, and the posterior subcapsular or the posterior polar cataract, again, accounts for 20% of the cataract subgroups. So we all started with the mobiles, where the incoming was 70 rupees and outgoing was again 70 rupees. But yes, now we proudly own the mobile. So I lay my case. You can switch off the music and you can speak because otherwise you are not audible at all. Okay? Yeah. Please okay. go So high accurate capsulotomies, powerful effective freco fragmentation and the timed incisions. So these white cataracts, we all have in our practice more than 20% high intralenticular pressures. And look, with the routine surgeries, this is what we have. We have the Argentine and flex signs. So believe me, more than 99% complete capsulotomies twice stronger, they are predictable, precise, and more sustainable in size and shape than manual. And yes, what if our optometrist sitting in the OR next to you and does this all for you? In less than a second, a time taken for a complete capsulotomy. And believe me, what I'm looking as a refractive surgeon is the right effective lens position, which is given to me by the right capsular axis. And believe me, it is right in the center of the bag so angle alpha and angle kappa, when we are talking of these premium patients, 
we all want the effective lens position and yes with all these modern generation iuls the lens has to be centered like this day one crystal clear cornea lens in the back posterior polar cataracts yes and what is i believing is the posterior safety margin which i know instead of doing a hydro delineation i would always do a femto delineation so yes the live 3d oct in these machines gives me quite capability and the recent article published by professor dr mahipal et al itself speaks of that these 3d octs can give us a clue to the defect or a pre existing defect in the posterior surface of the capsule so on the fly if you feel you can always change and look what i'm doing here i know there is a defect so i'm changing i'm shifting the posterior demarcation line and so i can safely delineate these patients yes these are all premium patients every eye is premium like my own eye and therefore i want the technology i want the best i don't want to land up with nucleus drops and this is what i achieve a simple dimple down technique and a safe high implantation of the iul brown cataracts yes i receive n number of calls i have a patient with brown cataract can you with near elimination of ultrasound complete softening and an effective phaco time in these patients is almost median ept of almost 0.4 seconds in all these grade 4 cataracts and yes these nucleus behave you have to have a uh, segment soft spacing a grid spacing and you have to increase the repetition time and yes very safely these brown cataracts can be handled and my dear all the studies that have been quoted i'll answer one by one and this is what the pre chopped nucleus looks like and can safely be handled the nature of the human race is not to accept changes believe me all the 13 people involved in this webinar all own a laser cataract system dr amar and dr mahipal doing the largest volumes so acceptance by the doins themselves flex is an evolving technology all the study quoted there are gray areas these are outdated and the comparisons don't hold true the study is done in the learning curve the type of the system used and the hardware and the software are always evolving over a period the meta analysis shown does not show i agree a difference between flex and mics but yes there is a huge statistical significant difference for flex when you talk of the effective phaco time the capsulotomy circularity the post op corneal thickness and the corneal endothelial cell reduction i think these are the critical areas where you need to address the cataract believe me in this covid environment you can't put the mask on your face or you have you can't put the mask on your eyes you have to put the mask right on on front of your face to avoid so believe me in an era if you have a femto laser system which is equivalent to cost of a phaco machine and the cost of uh, loi is equivalent to the cost of the cassette believe me how many of you would defer from getting a flex rather than uh, voting in just for a phaco system i believe me flex would be the future game changer when you will have the lenses being fixed on the refractive background with the flex energy yes that would be a game changer thank you thanks dr sonu goel and uh, we'll quickly go Can on I... again lot of questions coming dr gaurav uh, dr dhami uh, oh. you wanted to say something okay so i have a quick question first uh, you know i'll come to all three of you uh, dr mahipal sir who's been one of the pioneers of femto laser assisted cataract surgery my first question is to you sir that uh, would you yourself choose a femto laser assisted cataract surgery and why if you were undergoing a cataract surgery and you had dr amar there or dr dhami there to do it for you uh, with an excellent phaco would you still uh, or maybe rithika was there to do a perfect uh, uh, cataract surgery so phaco maybe, maybe i won't go in for amar because he has he doesn't do femtos <laughs> 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 he'll do a phaco net for me but in any case uh, i think uh, that's a no brainer from my perspective i think uh, all the things that have been said by harshul uh, is what normally is the commonest mistake that anybody makes is that you try to compare a novice or a technology which is evolving with a mature technology so i think a lot of studies that get quoted are studies when the phaco the flex technology was not of age today and uh, uh, believe me all the uh, ever since i have laid my hand on femto lasers uh, let it be any type of cataract except for a small pupil Uh, i would always uh, have or a dense corneal opacity i would always want to do a femto laser and whether it be a chief minister or a minister or a secretary or 
uh, one of my all all the ophthalmologist uh, i have had a femto done except for somebody who had post rk etc where i didn't want to use it but apart from that all ophthalmologists that i have operated they have themselves opted for a femto uh, all the uh, top vips uh, that is there i have done with femto and i don't think there is anything uh, because there are a lot of people who are willing to pay and definitely the amount of what uh, sonu has said that the effective peco time uh, goes down uh, the clarity of the cornea is much better the uveitis post op inflammation etc is much less and obviously the centration for whatever it is worth i think it is very very important and that also is very good the question that uh, harshul talked about the strength of the capsulotomy there could be measurements about strength of the capsulotomy but what we have to see in real time as to what is the practicality of the whole thing in practical situations the capsulotomy is really strong enough to handle any type of cataracts without a rip off so all in all if you ask me a question i have zero hesitation to get a femto done on my own uh, eye and that is what i uh, would wish to say that uh, i uh, that is definitely the choice procedure that i have uh, and overall i think the prices are coming down the loi prices are going down and today as uh, i have said so often 70% of my patients uh, for cataract surgery are blacks thanks dr maypal sir and we have no doubts with you doing sometimes 300 procedures in a month your uh, lois will also be probably much cheaper than what everybody else <laughs> gets you know with that kind of volume they would be supplying you many free of cost as well i'm sure all the same uh, your point will taken and they are very valid i'll quickly go on to dr amar sir over here because you know he him being one of the most prolific uh, feco sir yeah. uh, he does of a few uh, femto laser machines as well sir would you choose a uh, femto laser assisted cataract surgery for your routine patients or would you reserve them just for your complex cataracts like the subluxated or pseudo exfoliation or the intumescent and what is i think for these white cataracts the intumescents i think femto makes sense you know in a subluxated definitely i think it doesn't make any sense because i might do a glue dial in those cases coming to one point which mahipal very nicely said is the strength of the rexis is very strong you know it might be that the manual is slightly better but i tell you what as he said very correctly just theoretical but saying all this i am very comfortable with the non femto surgeries because the problem which i see in femto one is the time the two the suction the congestion which starts the third biggest problem is the pupil coming down and finally the cortical removal these are negative points of femto which people should realize one more thing is if you don't have a femto please i don't think doctor should think oh i've lost the whole thing in life because i tell you honestly i'm very comfortable with a non femto surgery and i think those who don't have femto i think you're still winners all the way so you can if you have the femto go ahead like mahipal is using but if you don't have i don't think there's anything wrong in it view and dr dhami sir what has kept you from uh, going the femto or the Sorry, catalyst uh, one, one, one the... second gorav uh, yes. one second i just want to add actually one particular thing which is again a misconception in people's mind it has increased my speed of doing surgeries because if you have somebody else doing a laser outside then you can easily reduce the time that is there because the actual time once the uh, pre cutting has been done outside goes down by at least 2 minutes as compared to a 7 minute thing it goes down to about 4 to 5 minutes if all the pre chopping and the capsulotomy etc has been done the other important thing that has been missed out is the astigmatism control up to 1 and a half diopters or 1.25 diopters so the time taken is really not an issue uh, which is there you should always co use another surgeon or another person to cut it outside and bring it and what you were talking about again uh, the uh, tomato eye or the cherry red spots have are not there when you are using a liquid optic interface so when you are using a liquid optic interface it's very very gentle the patient keeps on seeing throughout and there is no meiosis Uh, to the extent that you should be bothered about at all because the earlier one where the energy levels that were used were much higher and the docking was much more stronger that you would tend to get the meiosis but when you are using a liquid optic interface uh, the uh, the meiosis is not there and you don't get cherry red spots plus the time taken is much less if you have somebody else assisting you outside so actually i my number of cases that i am able to take out is much higher if you have somebody helping you Thanks, Dr. Mahipal sir.
up quickly to Dr. Dhami sir for his views on whether he would choose for your for his own surgery. Would he come down to Delhi or uh, uh, you know get his femto surgery done, or he would still want to get a cataract surgery from a phaco surgeon? See, after hearing Dr. Sanugoh, a perfect you know he described the technology so well. But Dr. Harshul Tak left nothing unturned about the phaco, and I believe when the patient asks me, "What will you give me better?" I have no answer. I can give him the same vision with FECO and FEMTO. So the decision goes, I would love to have a FECO from a surgeon of my choice. True. Very well put. Dami, very well put, I think. That's a very good Thank surgeon. you, ma'am. Thank you. Yeah. I think the surgeon makes the difference. I think what Dami is trying to tell everyone is a very clear message. You know, please understand, uh, it's the surgeon who's making the difference. You know, let's like take Maipal. Maipal is a three-minute surgeon. Now, whether you put him in femto or you put him on non-femto, he'll finish the surgery in three minutes. So that's the surgical skill which a Maipal or anybody else like a Kumar doctor or somebody bring on the table. So that's where the score comes, you know. It's not the machine. So I don't want people to go back for a message thinking is the mess. femto is making Maipal a great surgeon. Maipal itself is a great surgeon anyway. Thanks, Dr. Amar. And, you know, I think... Uh... We have the votes, but before I give, the, give out the votes, I'll quickly chip in from my experiences. I started off seven years back on one of the platforms, had a great go with the thing, but things were moving slow. So last four or five years, I switched to another new platform, the Catalyst one, which I'm using now. Things are completely changed. All the things that Dr. Amar told about, uh, you know, the uh, meiosis, the cherry red, and all these things that we used to see sometimes have gone away completely. And now my workflow is very fast. So the time taken, and I love to do it for RKIs, for eyes with pseudo exfoliation, intumescent. But the take home message that if you are a brilliant FACO surgeon, you don't have to depend on a femtosecond still. You can still do it. Surgery with FECO. So I think points well taken. Now, if I go by the votes, uh, you know, the voting pattern is threes to two for FECO. Yet, that's probably because, you know, we have about a thousand <laughs> FECO surgeons and we have only about maybe 100 uh, femto surgeons. Still, threes to two is still, uh, you know, kind of. Good. Then, uh, but, you know, still, uh, femto has a great. Gaurav, I think it so is I think, changing uh, very fast. Gaurav, I think it's changing very fast. Had you taken a vote two years ago, it would have been five is to one, I am sure. I understand. So that's what I think Gaurav. more and more people are convinced. And Gaurav. as platforms Can improve and technology improves. Can but I think after, after this COVID situation and economy going down, this ratio will further go down, I'm sure. Price will <laughs> come down and the machines will be given to you for free. Can, Wonderful. I think we should be one thing. Which is for Jaswinder and the company is that let the prices slash down and let the technology flow so that we can really have a feel of the technology. Thanks a lot, Dr. Sonu and Dr. Harshul. We'll quickly go on Thank to the you. next situation. Thank I would you. like Thank to you invite Dr. Uh, beyond till the end of the Thank session. Thank you, Dr. Sonu. We'll quickly like to invite our next speakers. We have two prolific speakers who uh, are going to then debate it out on whether uh, we have Dr. Chitra Murthy and Dr. Sri Ganesh. I think Dr. Sri Ganesh goes in first. Uh, no, no. We are going to discuss a very, very important thing. Uh, what this COVID crisis has brought about is that we uh, you know with the lockdowns and everything happening, our practices are all shut from cataract surgery. is screen days, maybe lasting another month. We come back and we'll, we'll have to fight it after the lockdown opens, uh, you know, boldly or should we still wait and, you know, go easy on it and start, not start cataract surgeries right after the lockdown opens. So I'll have Dr. Sri Ganesh. I Hello. I think Shiri Ganesh, you start. I think there is some problem yeah. with the audio with the, yeah. Uh, Gaurav. Yeah, Shiri, you start. Good evening, dear friends, and uh, I would like to thank uh, Gaurav for inviting me to this uh, debate. And uh, let me get my uh, slides on and share my slides. And uh, uh, not to be left behind, you know, after this, after this interesting debate, we have an even more interesting one on uh, laser, uh, on uh, whether femtolasic or smile or surface ablation. And we have three brilliant speakers. And also remember to start voting as soon as both these speakers have spoken. And very interesting debate. Will you start your cataract OT right after the lockdown opens or not? Okay, and I, yeah, Okay, thank you, Gaurav. And uh, my opinion is, yes, we need to start the cataract OT immediately once the lockdown opens. Because we all know now that the lockdown has been extended for another 15 days. And uh, so this becomes very relevant. And uh, you can see that our 
Prime Minister uh, Shri Narendra Modi said uh, when he actually addressed the nation about the lockdown, he said uh, that Jan hai to jaha hai. That means if you have life is more important, and if you have a life, then you can think about uh, livelihood. But recently he has changed this to Jan bi jaha bi. That means life and livelihood also or economy also because this is very important because without a livelihood you cannot actually live so you cannot be af so afraid of the corona that you die, die of uh, starvation and this is something that we should all use our common sense uh, before uh, we take decisions as all of you all know cataract is the bread and butter of an ophthalmic practice and it accounts for major uh, majority of the revenue that is earned by any institute the doctors, staff, utilities have to be remunerated and already we are all suffering because uh, one month of lockdown, our revenues have come to a standstill and we are all discussing how we are going to pay our um, uh, dues to the doctors, to the staff and uh, rentals and uh, other utilities. And how long can you go on without funds? I know my opponent is, has very deep uh, pockets, but even with that, uh, I don't think you can continue forever. And also, the future looks a little uh, unsure with economic uh, depression looming ahead. And there are a lot of uh, financial experts who have predicted that this is going to be worse than the Great Depression. So we sh the earlier we start earning, the better, because the practice is not going to go back from day one to what it was before. So we have to start early and see that we are able to be financially stable. So why are we so afraid of Corona? Of course, it is highly contagious, but in India, we have not yet reached stage three. We have not yet reached the community spread. So we need not really be so frightened. And infections are an occupational hazard for doctors. We are always operating on patients. So many of our patients have HIV, hepatitis, tuberculosis, et cetera, but it's not that we turn them away. We take extra precautions. Uh, and then operate. So similarly with the COVID also, you'll have to take uh, your precautions. Uh, the personal protective equipment has to be in place and you have to have protocols for patients, for staff, for doctors uh, and how you are going to manage them. And this is something that you will have to have in place before you start. See, my opponent may say that hospitals are COVID hotspots. But I would like to, I would beg to defer because this applies only to general hospitals dealing with sick patients, uh, with admissions who come in with fever and illness. Coming to cataract, it's a 15 minute daycare procedure with minimal contact and mostly on uh, healthy patients. And so if you are very careful, if you maintain social distancing and uh, you are uh, careful with all the precautions, then there is no need to worry because the patient is not going to stay there also. You just do your surgery and then immediately discharge them. And they need not even come for post-op reviews because the post-op reviews can be done by uh, telemedicine. In fact, the complication rates are so low. Uh, in our center, it's just about 0.3%. So most of the patients uh, don't have any issues and you just need to talk to them via telemedicine and um, just assure them and ask them if they're doing well. And then you can see them only at 15 days for uh, glasses prescription. This way you can actually reduce the number of patients coming to your hospital and uh, you should have this in place. Of course, if you have a complicated case, uh, then you can ask them to come for a post-op review. You can also have different operating teams uh, operating at different times. So they're not in contact with each other because if any of them also contacts COVID at any time, you need not close down the entire OT or the hospital. So that is something that uh, you can take care of. And uh, strict pro cleaning protocols after each case and session. And you can also uh, have distancing of patients and attendants and maintain a minimum six foot distance. You can allow only patients to come in, attendants can wait in their cars. And once the surgery is done, you can um, actually call them to take the patients. And the pre-op tests also can include ESR and total count. So you will have an idea if this patient is uh, having any problem like uh, uh, neutropenia, lymphopenia, or a high ESR, then you can uh, avoid taking them up. And we have made protocols already in our uh, hospitals uh, when we are going to start as to how we are going to uh, examine patients in the OPD, the general instructions, and then uh, important requirements, uh, hand sanitizers, gloves, masks, 
and these are all our protocols at the entrance at the lobby what we are going to do at the front desk and um, also uh, optometry consultation with doctors what happens at the pharmacy opticals we have a complete uh, flow chart in place and uh, also screening protocols when the patient comes in so these are all very important even uh, donning and doffing of uh, ppe uh, and uh, so these are all things that we have already made when we have the time and we are uh, prepared uh, now so that once the lockdown is open then we can start functioning and financially we can be stable and uh, try to sustain the practice because if you, you cannot keep on uh, postponing uh, cataract surgery because that brings in the revenue and if you don't do that then how long are you going to wait until you get a vaccine but anyway this virus is not going to go away uh, and uh, slowly sometime or the other you have to open up and then the only way you can uh, go about it is by herd immunity which will develop slowly it's just that the lockdown is to flatten the curve so that we don't uh, we are not overwhelmed the healthcare system is not overwhelmed but that can does not prevent us surfing? from uh, can, can going uh, yeah so going ahead with our uh, um, work so in conclusion don't succumb to the idle surgeon syndrome and develop rusty hands <laughs> uh sustenance is as important as safety that is important jaan bhi jahan bhi thank you very much for your attention thanks a lot shrigesh uh, so we are quickly going on we are running a little behind schedule i'll request dr chitra ramamurthy to please load up her presentation and uh, stick to her time at 5 minutes ma'am uh, we are really looking forward to hear what you have to say uh, you are she is going to give the counterpoint and please start voting uh, for the audience as soon as dr chitra finishes this will be an interesting vote will you start your cataract ot immediately after the lockdown opens or will you not will you uh, wait to open it like won't you start it so you can reply by saying yes or no if you say yes you assume that you are starting it and if you say no in the comments we'll assume that you don't want to start it immediately gorav can you see my video yes ma'am please go ahead So first and foremost, thanks Gaurav and all the leaders of IRSI for having me here today. Sri Ganesh, I heard your talk. So do we start the cataract OT immediately after lockdown? Before we say that, just remember that we are in a pandemic era. Look at the smiling crowd of people with their own anticipations and desires and expectations and their own set of secure insecurities. let us also understand not moving the video is not moving just one minute yeah so let us also understand today that social distancing is going to be a mantra for survival and our potential cataract surgery patients would rather be in their safe surrounds than be anywhere near you dear opponent I do believe that cataract is the bread and butter survival for us but in the next few months nothing is going to be written in black and white but there are going to be transitions of gray which is what we need to remember there has to be a sea change in our realism in this lockdown period first and foremost all of us including our patients would have developed that altruistic thought the mood set where you realize that what you thought you need is not actually what you need so there has been time and space for more realism in their minds and their imagined needs and your 69 cataract patient realizes that they are seeing well enough to manage their own requirements in other words their needs are not as overwhelming as we would like them to be probably they would have even got time now to reflect on the brevity of life but dear opponent i'm not telling us that we launch into negative thinking but be cognizant of the fact that in the next 3 4 months there is going to be a setback and reality is a food for thought against the actual needs so first and foremost surgeries are going to get postponed because the need is not realized the spending comfort has going to, is going to be challenged and not a single patient is going to get carried away by you or your counselor anymore on an imagined vision threat 
again. Cash crunch will be significant. It could be brief, of course, and I wish it to be so. But let's not escape the possible thought that there could be a fresh wave of COVID disease attacking us. So we need to be realistic. Insurance companies are definitely going to tighten their strings with their own challenges. Believe me, my friends, the very desire to enter an imagined busy hospital is going to be challenged and a fearsome journey. Not to mention all those protective gears which you're going to install right from the entrance to all the way in, it would be like entering a tunnel of dread. In fact, there have been anecdotal reports which have told us that some of our cataract patients who could have had a COVID disease, when they undergo an elective procedure, even something as simple as a cataract surgery, we need to be conscious that some of the comorbidities could flare up and there could even be fatality. So let's look at the actuals. Sri Ganesh, it's not going to be the same OT setup for us anymore for a while. The overhead, we are not even sure about whether we need the PPEs, whether we need those N95 masks. There is ever evolving, changing OT functioning. There are newer sterilization techniques which are coming up time and again. You have to clean the OT between cases. There's going to be a lag time. And more importantly, we need to investigate more thoroughly. Even if you desire not to do so, your patients are going to be in insistent on that investigation. You need to get the, all those extra cautious consent forms. You need a standby anesthetist. I'm sure both of us already have it as a routine norm, but each one of us would have to plan to have that. And most importantly, we need to remember that economy has taken a beating, which means emergency procedures would continue, but people would stop to think about electives. So let's not stake a peace of mind. Let's also be realistic that we need to have n number of OPDs to translate into n number of surgeries. In other words, you need to ensure that you reach that threshold of OPD volumes for your cataract surgeries to come pouring in. We need to be acceptant. We need to be cognizant of the fact that your premium IOLs is going to get a beating. We need to be also realistic that our patients are going to be quite paranoid with increased expectations and complaints and extremely demanding. And when all this is being said, just one COVID patient in your hospital, your entire hospital and staff would go on a quarantine for 28 days, a complete break. I'm not saying that we don't practice ophthalmology. I'm telling us to be realistic of how this pandemic is going to attack us. Probably teleophthalmology would pick up at rapid sites, but actual cataract surgeries is definitely going to take a beat. Sit back, my friend. We have a whole life ahead of us. This is going to be a more sedate practice with its upheavals in the coming times. Cataract surgery in the post-COVID times, dear friend, we need to take a deep breath. It's not going to be happening at our imagined phase for a long time to come, probably. Does it mean, I don't want to believe. Do we need to relax? Do we need to redefine our pace? Is it going to be a bullock cart's ride? It is definitely not going to be a bike racing, dear friend. Does that mean that I say it's impossible to do a cataract surgery? No, I was debating till now, but being an ophthalmic surgeon, I wish that we need not become as optimistic as Sri Ganesh, need not be as realistic as I had to be to win this debate, but I wish there is a middle path where we are human and reasonable and accept that cataract surgery is an elective procedure. We have our cataract patients or older patients and we keep all of this in mind and take the right judgment forward. Thank Thanks you. a lot, Dr. Chitra, ma'am. Uh, I'll quickly go on because we are a little bit behind schedule. Dr. Amar, uh, I have a quick question for you, sir. Yeah. So you are managing so many hospitals and you know uh, it's a huge uh, number of centers that uh, you're managing what is your thought that uh, will be able to start safely for cataract surgeries right after the lockdown opens or would you like to go slow and you know uh, maybe start the opds first and come back with the surgeries a little later to be honest we, have we need to start we need to start the surgeries only thing is remember one thing we do have the temperature control for all the patients who are walking in what we are doing is we are having protective one gear moment, right sir. now. One moment, sir. Dr. Chitra, can you switch off your presentation, please? Can I you think be healthy? Can I you... to take it off and uh, just get onto the gallery. No, you don't have to switch off your presentation. You have to take it off from the screen sharing. At the bottom, you know, from the screen sharing, just remove it. There's Exit. a green one below, uh, Chitra. 
Yes, yeah, okay. thank you. Yeah. Yes, so, okay. so basically what I'm suggesting to people is that, listen, first of all, we need to get back to OT. Okay, you can do tele-ophthalmology, everything is fine, but in the end of the day, you need to operate patients also. Yes, as Chitra said, we have to be very careful <coughs> and take precautions. So the way we do that is basically use your temperature control for patients who are walking in. Second thing is give protective gear like your N95 mask or goggles, especially to our doctors. But at the end of the day, we need to be inside the operation theater. Take extra precautions, yes, but we'll have to start operating definitely. So Dr. Ahmad, there's a quick question. Would you be testing? Would you? It's all for COVID-19 for antibodies or for mm -hmm. uh, you know active infection or would you go just like uh, you know centers are doing virus screening for HIV and hepatitis and stuff. If you have a good quick rapid antibody test, would you do it for all your surgery patients before? No, I don't think we'll be able to do it for all our patients right now. First of all, it's going to be very difficult anyway. Even if you want to do, you can't do it. So and if it's it not comes possible. positive, what if someone you... has a different cough or a fever, as Chitra said very correctly, if someone has a cough and a fever, definitely then we will... Send them because there is, a, there is a bigger number of asymptomatics than the symptomatics. I understand that point, but I tell you what, it's going to be practically impossible. It's nice to say that we'll test everybody, but it's practically going to be very, very tough to examine every patient because not only the patient, suppose the attendant comes in and it's not only the surgical patient, it can be a non-surgical patient also who can have the same problem. That means now if by chance you are having, let's say somebody has, let's say 100 or 200 OPD a day, you're going to do 200 tests Plus one patient comes in with two attendants, let's say. That means every day you'll do with like 600 tests. It's not going to happen. No, but so, I think uh, uh, yes, what is uh, realistically is... going to happen is that uh, the number of patients coming in in the beginning would be less. So you need to space out these patients and actually maybe even work on Sundays and do the OT and the OPD at separate times and don't, uh, there shouldn't be a clogging of the OT. Though uh, there are hospitals like Max, et cetera, who had a problem, the uh, patient presented with cardiac symptoms and et cetera, and was admitted for in cardiology and turned out to be COVID uh, uh, positive subsequently. And there are 20 people who have got this infection. The ideal, what they have done now is that for any patient who's going to be taken up for surgery, intubation, extubation has the largest risk. So taking up patients in GA should be done the last. Uh, because that will that is where you can have uh, the transmission uh, level going up. But Max Hospital today is doing a pre-operative check for all patients. I think all the hospitals taking up patients, uh, all multi-specialty hospitals taking them up for surgery are preferring to do a COVID test for those patients. The logistics of it being able to be done is something that needs to be understood. But as things stand now, you should space out the patients and not have too many patients going into the OR, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And uh, obviously, all of us uh, should be using all disinfections, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera, that is there. But yes, that is a definite risk. Ophthalmologists, ENT surgeons have been shown to be at the maximum risk, ten times higher. Uh, of getting a COVID infection as compared to a normal population. So that is something that one has to see, but I think you need to space them out. One thing, and if possible, you should ideally get a test done for the patient who are going in for surgery. Uh, as of now, it's not possible, as Amar said, but I think over time, you will have more of these kits coming around. Uh, One thing I suggest to people, everybody here in the audience, especially listening is, you might have to reduce the number of attendants coming in with the patient. Yes. And that's a very, very easy thing which we have to do. You can ask the attendants to sit in a car outside and not Correct. come in. We don't allow more than one attendant to come in. Uh, that's for sure. Uh, do not allow more than one attendant. Have a thermometer uh, outside and a history taking outside. And we have circulated from AIOS a consent form that the patient will not sue you in case the patient gets uh, uh, an infection within the hospital. That's something uh, which again, uh, is could be a problem. So, so Dr. Pal, we have yes, yes, Ganesh. We have already made protocols like I showed, and then if you want, we can anybody who wants it so can just Ganesh, uh, email me and. Uh, it, Shri Ganesh, there are a lot of questions. Uh, we have more than uh, twelve hundred questions already, fifteen hundred of, and many people are asking for you to share your protocol and. Uh, Gaurav, I can't, we can't hear you. Gaurav, you uh, need to do something about your internet connection because every time you have a problem, even today, the audio is not coming. Yeah. Can I you think I can, I, can, I can share it. What I'll do is I'll put it on our website so you all can visit our website, www.netradama.org. So I'll plan to put it in a couple of days and then uh, uh, you all can go through it and adapt it if you feel it is suitable for your practice. 
So there is one more question which has come up that would you prefer to operate uh, in a OT which has a model which is a modular OT with uh, AHU or would you prefer to operate in another OT which has no AHU with recirculation? We have uh, AHU with recirculation, uh, twenty times uh, um, recirculation. Uh, so this is as per the NABH standards, and then we will continue that. Uh, most important is the PPE. And then what we, we plan to do is have operating teams. We have three operating teams that operate in different times of the day. So they don't meet each other. And between the, and you, so that what happens is the cases can be spaced out. So we are not going to call them all at once. So there is, you can maintain that distancing and also clean in between cases. So Ganesh, will you be using a full PPE? See, there are three kinds of PPE kits. What kind of PPE will you use? And will you change the full PPE after each case? We will be using the full PPP, PPE and then ideally it is best to change the full uh, PPE uh, after each case and also do a cleaning before you take in the next patient. So that will impact the cost of surgery tremendously if you're going to do all these things and spacing them out and everything. I think we'll all have to factor in those things. Dr. Dhami, yeah, would you like to cost to about? Uh, it's going to cost about 2,000 rupees extra per case. And I think we can absorb it in Nish, the cost. Uh, that is just a PP cost. You know, normally you operate one case in three to four minutes. Now you'll be operating one case in 30 minutes. Yes, but the thing is, the number of cases are going to come down. It's not going to be uh, as many and we're going to space it out. And Dr. Dami, would, would, would you like to yeah, with your views? I, I, I agree with saying this, but we already have orders from the statement to keep our hospitals open. And it's our yeah. duty to space the patients and see how we can best. Whether we can do elective surgeries or not is going to be the question next week. And we are just sorting out our appointments. And I rightly agree with Dr. Amar. You have to continue the work, but it's the way how you want to go. The state government has already passed orders that if you don't keep your hospitals open, I'll shut them permanently, whether it's a private or a government. Thanks, Dr. Dhami. We are going to move on to the next question. What happened to the uh, you know, The only thing we'll have to keep in mind is that yes, the government wants us to remain open, but they are not insisting that you do elective surgery. And if something goes wrong, we'll have to take full responsibility. We'll have to look at the consent from the patients. We'll also have to look at many things. Yes, need to start it as soon as possible, but with full precautions. I think, uh, thanks a lot, both the speakers. We are running a little behind. Uh, I'll, Gaurav, yes. they are asking, I think what I saw, the voting was almost equal. Yes, again, voting is almost equal for both things. Uh, there are, you know, when uh, Sri Ganesh finished, everybody wanted to say yes. And when Dr. Chitra finished, everybody started <laughs> saying no. So I think both speakers have made their points. And uh, we all have to move on with caution as best as we can. Thank you. I'll invite our next speaker. And we have a new situation to deal with. Uh, we are going to talk about, you have a 23-year-old daughter who wants surgery. We are all LASIK surgeons uh, amongst all the three speakers. Now, we are all looking at uh, wanting to do surgery refractors and with a very healthy cornea, good cornea thickness, good topographies, no contraindications for surgery and a highly motivated patient. Are we going to choose LASIK, femtolasic, or a surface ablation or smile? And we are going to have Dr. Sharma, one of the most experienced refractive surgeons who does all the three techniques and she's going to give her answer. Dr. Namrata, please. So thank you, Gaurav, and uh, I'm going to be talking about uh, the refractive surgery part. I would like to thank uh, Dr. Maipal Sachdev, Dr. Amar Agarwal, Dr. Dhami sir, and Gaurav for making me a part of uh, this webinar. And the question is that uh, your daughter is 23 years old, six diopters, stable myopia, healthy cornea, and wants refractive surgery. And of course, my answer is femtosecond LASIK surgery. Important slide is this, there are no financial or proprietary interests which are involved. And uh, one has to look at the track record of the good outcomes and one has to look at evidence-based uh, med medicine. The femtosecond LASIK has been with us for the last 17 years and the SMILE was only approved four years uh, uh, in 2016. And PRK, of course, has its own set of problems which I'll be discussing. So if you see the visual equity outcomes in the SMILE, especially for myopes which are high, 
the range is 59 to 97% plus minus 0 0.5 diopters. And for femtosecond LASIK, it is 86 to 96% within uh, 0.5 diopters. So look at the variability. Uh, it is much more with smile as compared to femtosecond LASIK. If you see the visual quality in the early phase, it is definitely much better with femtosecond LASIK, and this is attributed to the interface haze in smile. And there is a wow factor with femtosecond LASIK, which cannot be compared to smile. My opponent may say that uh, smile also has a wow factor, but the, if the patient hasn't had LASIK, how will he compare the wow factor of LASIK with the wow factor of smile? That you can compare because you are operating on both kinds of patients. So customization is possible with the femtosecond LASIK and uh, uh, it gives superior visual outcomes as compared to smile. So if you have to do a topo guided uh, femtosecond LASIK, then that is possible only on a platform which has uh, femtosecond LASIK uh, versus smile. And this is a study which was a randomized control style, a contralateralized study. And you cannot have a better comparator than this where the results of topo guided LASIK were found to be superior. Uh, both subjectively and objectively. And this was mainly because of additional centration and cyclo rotation intraoperative compensation by the examiner laser. Then the, sometimes you have to customize in terms of wavefront guided LASIK. And again, that can be done better with the femtosecond LASIK as compared to the smile. And uh, you tend to have more higher vertical coma, which is found in the spine, especially if the myopia is more. So there's uh, eye tracking, uh, lack of eye tracking, decentered treatment. And this is especially important when you have large angle kappa and patient control fixation in smile also may not be that reliable. As far as the biomechanics are concerned, uh, some studies have found no difference. And there are multiple instruments which themselves are not standardized like Ora or Corvus. And Jill et al has have clearly shown that the posterior corneal keratometric power and asphericity uh, does get significantly changed. So there's no blanket protection against ectasia. Now, if you do have regression, which you may have uh, when the uh, myopia is high, then you have uh, options in LASIK. You can go ahead and you know do a retreatment, but redos in a smile become a problem. You have to resort to surface ablation or you have to resort to uh, a, a, a procedure which is uh, have to convert it to a, a LASIK. Then again, visual recovery, especially in the early post-op period may be slower. And this is mainly because of the micro distortions, which may be there in the Bowman's membrane. The patient higher uh, with LASIK as compared to with smile. And again, this is because of the manipulations in the uh, smile uh, procedure. Then if you have complications, for instance, if you have a cap tear or a retained lenticule, then again, it becomes more difficult to manage the complications of smile as opposed to those of femtosecond laser. And look at the interface here. Uh, femtosecond laser will create an interface which is by femtosecond laser. Uh, there are no frills attached to it, but in SMILE, although the dissection would be done with femtosecond laser, but there is a mechanical uh, component which is involved in it. And SMILE is a single platform. You cannot do everything and anything with uh, SMILE, but with the femtosecond laser, there are multiple platforms uh, which are there, which are approved for both examiner laser and femtosecond, and uh, that is an advantage for the surgeons. Then coming to PRK, pain, of course, has not been able uh, to be taken care of, and there are multiple ways in which pain has been addressed for PRK till today uh, with all sorts of uh, drops and even contact lenses laden with these uh, drops. Then outcomes in terms of uh, best corrected visual ac acuity, again, if you see high myopes are not that great. There are problems with epithelization. There are problems of haze. And to address that, if you use mitomycin C, then there are other set of problems with that. And if you look at the transmission electron microscopy also, there is you know, blebbing, uh, uh, which can be seen with the surface procedure. And if you have something like this haze, then you lose the best corrected uh, visual acuity. And then again, there are whole uh, sort of uh, uh, lists which are given as to how to decrease this corneal haze. And uh, this is a report by American Academy of Ophthalmology for mitomycin C. So one has to use it very, very carefully. And again, uh, you can't sit back as you can sit back with femtosecond LASIK after doing it. And this uh, says it all. Uh, this is a meta-analysis for efficacy, predictability, safety, and visual quality of laser corneal refractive surgery. And it was highest in terms of the, uh, these parameters with LASIK and femtosecond LASIK and SMILE are the new approaches, but they ranked lower than this. So I have to say nothing because this graph says it all. 
femtosecond LASIK is sitting at the top, followed by the surface procedure and then by the smile procedure. And why for my daughter, for all daughters and sons, I would do femtosecond LASIK surgery. Thank you for your kind attention. Thanks a lot, Dr. Namrata. Can you take off your presentation? That was a really nice one. And now we'll quickly go on to our next speaker, uh, Dr. Rupal Shah, who has been a pioneer of SMILE. And uh, she will be speak making a case for SMILE for her daughter. Thank you, Gaurav. Am I, am I seen? Am I visible? Yeah, we can see you. And uh, we, can, we would like to see your, uh, you know, your video is off. You can switch it on and then the presentation. Right now, we can see a nice picture. You, do, you can't see my presentation? Uh, not yet. Uh, just a moment. I'll try and get it on. So, also, I think your video is off. So, But that doesn't matter. If you can uh, share your screen, uh, that would uh, you know bring your presentation on and later you as well. Just start in a moment. Okay, we can see you now. And uh, now we want to see your screen. So is my... So Dr. Rupal... Is my screen the... getting okay. seen? We can't see your screen yet. We can see you still. But uh, if you can share your screen. So while she's uh, linking up the screen, I'll take a quick question. Uh, I'll put the first question to Dr. Amar, sir. Uh, Dr. Amar, if you had to uh, do surgery, I, this, let this not influence the debate, but uh, Dr. Amar, uh, what would be take, uh, you do all three procedures at your center and there are many doctors at your place. Uh, what would you choose if you had to do it for a relative or a family member of your own with these parameters at that age? I, I think Dr. Amar is not there. Let Dr. Maipal take the question. Yes. Uh, smile. Gitansha wants to do surgery, sir. What are you planning to do for her? Smile. Smile. But Gitansha hasn't, I got see a smile. Wearing... hasn't got a smile, done, neither and has Ritika. Nor is Ritika. And why is that? Let's let's uh, hear why. Uh... So that's a different debate altogether. Whether to get a refractive surgery or not to get a refractive surgery. But if you have to get a refractive surgery, which one will you get? That will be smile. So I think it basically I... depends on the patient's motivation also, whether you want to get it done or you are okay with glasses. Am I now visible? Uh, you are visible very nicely, ma'am, but not the screen. Not the screen. Not share, your slide. Like, no. Share the screen no. on the. In screen. case uh, if uh, Virinder is ready, we can take Virinder. Yeah, that's first. what I was saying. Maybe Virinder. Virinder, if you can, Doctor Virinder, the while time you fix up for these files. Yes. So in the meantime, uh, ma'am can work on it, and uh, we can have Doctor Virinder sure. Agarwal link uh, upload his presentation. Yes, I, I don't see Virinder. Maybe you will have to call him. I am ready. Okay, you ready. You I am ready. ready. You can upload your presentation, Doctor Virinder. Doctor Virinder is going to talk on surface again. A very experienced surgeon does all three uh, procedures and uh, has a, has one of the first smile machines in the country, if I remember correctly. Uh, and he is today going to make a case for surface ablation for his own daughter. And I would like to tell the audience that uh, while uh, this is a debate and uh, you know he may choose to do a different procedure in his own practice, but today we have requested Virinder to speak about surface ablation because he also does a lot of surface ablation. So Dr. Virinder, would you like to start? Uh, at the back end, okay. okay. I think Dr. Rupal's screen has come now. Can you go to slideshow? Start slideshow. Yes, please click there. Oh. Perfect. So I think uh, should start. Go to, now. go to full screen, please. Slideshow at the bottom. Yeah, at the bottom you can. Yeah. But I'm on. Uh -huh. Okay. okay. I'm sorry, Dr. Virendra, to get in like this. No, ma'am, it was your turn. Please. There was ahead. a power failure here, so I could not just talk. Thank you, Dr. Gaurav, and sorry for this interruption. Uh, and Namrata, thank you very much for making the surface ablation part clear. Uh, if uh, if my daughter was, uh, uh, say, 
23 years old 10 years back i would agree with most things that you would have said if my daughter was uh, 23 years old 25 years back maybe i would agree with what dr virendra would say but today if you ask me if my daughter is today 23 years old i would want to do smile for her and why smile because it uses femtosecond laser which you have said is so accurate the lenticule is separated and removed from a small incision and the dimensions correspond to the refractive error being corrected so no excimer laser yeah. is used no photoablation is carried out and the lenticule is physically removed from within the cornea this has several advantages the advantages of smile over femtolasic is the accuracy of treatment the stability less dry eye profile which is so common with making a flap and therefore a better safety profile less induction of aberrations better workflow and of course better economics in today's scene. the advantage is over surface ablation is quite stark which you have also pointed out less pain faster vision recovery less use of steroids less visits to clinics predictability and stability and why so because excimer laser does corneal reshaping with a procedure called photoablation now the photoablation as we all know the rate changes linearly with fluence beyond a certain threshold and it's also gets affected by a lot of things including the corneal hydration the humidity the depth of ablation organic vapors in the surrounding and therefore this results in a scatter especially for the treatment for high myopia smile uses cutting instead of ablation a binary process instead of a linear one either it cuts or it doesn't cut and when it cuts it cuts as absolutely accurately if you and and that i'm sure you'll agree with me and there is much less influence on any external factors and this is reflected in the tremendous accuracy achieved even in the first few eyes which were treated worldwide and it's especially interesting for high myopia group in which excimer laser definitely don't feel fare so well and there are numerous studies comparing the results of smile with lasik procedure Zhang et al. in fact performed a systematic review and meta analysis of 11 studies comparing smile with lasik and not just one which is also a study which shows the lasik results to be not so good which you have cited and uh, so it it i would just say that it's like you know anari ka khel na khel ka satyanash so and these meta analysis have shown that it has found no significant difference between the two procedures in terms of final refractive spherical equivalent the proportion of eyes losing one or more line of best corrected visual acuity while it has shown that the two years visual outcomes between smile and wavefront guided lasik have also been the same the accuracy was significantly better in smile group with 100% of the eyes achieving post op spherical equivalent within plus or minus 0.5 diopters versus 73% of the eyes in the lasik group which says a, a volume about the procedure as regards inflammation the total amount of energy input into the eye with smile is less than with femto lasik and this results in definitely a higher stability of treatment and this was very nicely demonstrated in singapore by this group uh, where they showed that there was the same amount of inflammation whether you treated a 3 diopter or a 9 diopter case and there are no flaps so no risk of flap displacements small incision incision means that you are cutting out minimum corneal nerves which means it's going to cause less dry eyes smaller reduction of corneal sensitivity less discomfort for the patient for a very small period and that's what they're looking for and and if it's my daughter of course i would also look for it more uh, than even, even otherwise and possibly a better biomechanical stability relative to a femto lasik as has been shown by uh, se several me uh, mathematical models as well as uh, the, the studies and there are number of studies that that has shown smile to be superior in terms of dry eyes and this has come from all across the world and it's not just me saying it so mai nahi kehti zamana kehta hai as regards inductions of aberrations excimer laser suffers from peripheral fluence loss because of fresnel reflection losses and therefore you need to increase in the and spot size in the periphery would cause such losses to be more which leads to an increase in spherical aberration today they have been minimized by newer ablation profile however with smile this problem just does not exist 
and therefore it would lead to less induction of spherical aberration which we have also seen as you can see here as we were asking about the wow factor we had treated 25 patients with high myopia more than six diopters one eye femtolasic the other eye smile so this was a direct comparison where the patient could also make out which i was feeling better and here is what it showed even objectively as you can see here the point spread function showed in the smile eye to be much better as compared to the femtolasic eye the image simulation also showed smile eyes to be doing better than femtolasic and this is also because of the true optical zone that a person gets in in smile eyes as compared to femtolasic which Dr. leads Gopal, to can you better stability <laughs> and better uh, optical aberration profile with a workflow improvement because you are not going to need to change stations and therefore lose less time plus there is an advantage of cost because you need only one laser instead of two the capital cost consumable cost and maintenance cost thus goes down by half so smile offers several advantages over both femtolasic and surface ablation it in fact combines the best of both worlds the femtolasic without the flap so the convenience the quick recovery and the less use of steroids and the you know, safety of but without the pain and then what else and what more do you want from a procedure thank you thanks a lot uh, dr rupal and uh, i think uh, we have a very interesting yes. to please join in and upload his presentation and uh, he is going to talk on surface ablation there is there has been a big uh, resurgence in uh, surface ablation and uh, more and more new techniques coming up uh, with uh, trans prk and with acuvail mm. and so on yeah but to screen I, dr virin please and lots of questions yeah, coming wrong. lots of questions so you know the audience i'll request uh, please uh, sending in your questions and once dr varinder finishes you can also uh, give your poll and i would also request you we are further planning about three four webinars before the lockdown finishes if you have any interesting what would you like to see us do uh, can you give in suggestions on what webinars you would like to you know see in future uh, what topics would you like discuss we are going to have a couple of debates like this and something else as well is like there is one international oh, webinar tomorrow gorov just yes. to inform everybody tomorrow there is a international webinar where irsi with aios and isrs right. are having at 6:30 in the evening which namrata is conducting so just uh, namrata at the end of the show can perhaps yes. put it on screen yes. at the end of it yes. wonderful wonderful sir and on 16th uh, at same time from the jnj team who have been nice enough to do this for us let's go ahead uh, dr virinder please uh, start off thank you goro and the team irsi for giving me this chance to present the surface ablation in the present scenario for my daughter or anybody's daughter the namrata has said one good thing that the different profiles are there so different profiles are available for surface ablation also that should be very clear safety should be our topmost priority without any financial disclosure for the talk i will put the surface ablation we have different options like prk trans prk all are giving almost the same results with some advantage in the newer technology of trans prk my friends are afraid of because of this they feel that there is a pain there is a haze there is a slow recovery there is a regression let me tell you these are the things of the past now it is not the common thing pain is taken care by different modes so friends no need to worry but there is a definite role of asa every refractive surgeon knows my friend namrata and rupal both knows that when there is a deep set eyes narrow pupil fracture thin cornea steep or flat cornea people who are in contact sports different services and when you have a typical basement dystrophy they you choose for surface ablation and there is a special call of surface ablation for residual correction and enhancement of post basic or post smile in patients of rk and whenever there is a refractive surprise as dr kumar also said that when there is a refractive surprise in eye all they can touch up with the refractive surgery the surface ablation post icl the power may be too high or there is a surprise and in some particular patients of keratoconus this can be linked with corneal cross linking to make the cornea better for visual outcome the technique is very simple you have to remove epithelium you have to the ablation can be done in all lasik mitomycin applied in all cases at my place and bcl at the end of the surgery the advantage is the bcl now can be swapped with keratolate 
good one rohit kapil india and pain management is very major in all circulation patients and we have to emphasize for the who have not seen the circulation very simple very easy you have to just apply alcohol to loosen the epithelium the alcohol is soaked over so there is no side effect on the surrounding cornea they can gradually gradually and now you know the epithelial like almost tap there is loss less of medical trauma which was inducing h and you the corneal hydration equal to this all abrasion profiles of lesic advantage are there with the surface abrasion also i have to the small number or a big number six number is not a big number though now we consider six diopter myopia is slightly higher than the abrasion so this point again so again at the end of the surgery take care of it this is very simple surgery you don't require much of the edges and no advanced platforms so surface abrasion is similar with the arm after three months the lesic gives immediate work factor but are you doing surgery for work factor or for safety for a lifetime ablation process are same as lesic as i said before and and newer profiles in which maybe ablation surface ablation is less than the lesic so it increases I think we've lost audio from. Uh... Doctor Virinder, we can't hear you now. Can anybody else? No, I think uh, the slides are also frozen. We got is. Uh... I think there is some problem. Yes. In right. So I think uh, let's go ahead with the discussion. Uh, I'll ask yeah. Doctor Dhami the first question. Uh, Doctor Dhami is a big. uh if Hello. you were in this situation dr dhami uh, are you online yeah yeah sir uh, if you had to be in this situation offer it for one of your family members with a minus 6 i i will definitely go okay. for surface ablation would you have concerns yeah. about the depth of ablation with a 6 diopters like uh, no, no, no. that would be almost uh, 90 microns and uh, even with mitomycin would you be concerned about risk of haze no 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 things are very different now surface ablation is uh, really very advanced if you in depth of vision with the use of metamycin is not at all a question what about the pain uh, have you been able to find an answer to pain very simple way you can uh, use a catarolac tipped contact lens or virtually if you can console the patient that you're going to have a pain just counsel him more than required he never he will never feel but she will never feel about the pain and what if your patient needs an enhancement sir i mean uh, surface has one big drawback for enhancement but if you need it but if i need it i'll have to go again but i think dr varinder has not mentioned for trans prk we are very much doing it and things have been little better than the routine prk with alcohol soaked then applying alcohol we even use it at a viscoelastic that is called a viscol technique where the alcohol doesn't spill over to the limbus or the limbus cells moving on to dr amar i know dr maipal uh, has convinced me to get the smile machine two years back so i know that he's going to tell me to do smile so i'll ask dr amar uh, before i go on to dr maipal for this uh, question amar sir uh, if you were in this situation uh, what uh, would you have chosen surface uh, femtolasic or smile to be honest this is a very normal patient let's say he's a normal thickness that's what you have said Yes. I would suggest yeah. either go for femtolasic or smile. Both give very good results. One thing, let's understand. One thing we need to tell the delegates is this: when you have a thinner cornea, let's say if I had a 500 micron cornea, that's where smile scores. Because I might not be able to do femtolasic in those cases. That's where it scores. Yes. But if you have a normal cornea, I think it's fantastic. You can use choose either femtolasic or you can use smile, whichever is available. Surface, to be honest, I'm not a great proponent of surface, though they are, there are people who are doing it and doing great results like Virendra and Dami have talked about. But if you ask me, I'll go for either femtolasic or smile. Both are fantastic procedures. Gaurav, are you there? So, have I, we got, have, I think we all are here. 
uh, Namrata, can you also just yeah. mention at this stage about tomorrow's webinar also? Yeah, I think, uh, should I share my yeah, screen? Yeah, please, can you share that for a second so that everybody gets into the thing and they can log in tomorrow at 6.30 in the evening. It's Indian time. Remember, is this is a combination. 6.30 or 7? 6.30. 6.30, Maipal. Sir, it's, it's 6.30. 6.30, okay, fine. Just to tell everyone, so, this is uh, also the combination with International Society of Refractive Surgery, the All India Ophthalmic Society, and IIRSA. Namrata, can you talk more on it? So, so this is a, a symposium which we are doing on tackling astigmatism. And uh, thanks to Amar for coordinating the whole thing. And uh, we have a brilliant, uh, in fact, a galaxy of speakers with us. And these timings are given separately because it's going to be transmitted uh, all, over the, uh, all over the globe. And uh, we have these uh, topics uh, which are being listed here. So how astigmatism is being dealt at the level of the cornea, at the level of the uh, lens, at the level of, in fact, iris also uh, will be discussed by each of the speakers. And this is the galaxy of speakers that we have. We have Professor Renato Ambrosio, who's the president of uh, International uh, Society of Refractive Surgery. Then we have Dr. George Waring uh, from Waring Vision Institute, uh, South California. And we have uh, Dr. William Trattler, who's uh, going to be uh, from Miami, uh, Florida. And apart from this, we have our own uh, team, uh, Dr. Amar Agarwal, who's going to be talking about the uh, the pinhole pupilloplasty, uh, Professor Maipal Sachdev, who's going to be talking about the toric eye wells, uh, Dr. G.S. Dhami, sir, uh, who's the president of um, IRSI, and Dr. Mohan Rajan, who's going to be talking about what, go, what to do when uh, the toric eye wells, they go wrong. So we look forward uh, to this, and uh, this is going to be uh, a truly international affair, and we are, we are going to have, uh, we are going to make it Facebook Live as well as YouTube Live. So uh, we will uh, catch up with you tomorrow on this uh, very important uh, webinar. And we hope to have many more such international webinars because now is the time to actually, uh, to actually connect with the whole globe and see what they are doing or what they've already done and how do we need to, uh, how do we need to address our own problems. Thanks, Namrita. So, you know, we have results from the poll, but uh, before I announce the results from the poll, can you exit that uh, screen? Yeah, yeah, I am. So, uh, I have had a question for Dr. Amar. Yes, Gaurav, Gaurav, can you just give me a minute, please? Gaurav? Just give me a minute. Actually, uh, just to carry on from where Dr. Namrata left, I think uh, there is a survey that is going to be mailed to you very soon from AIOS uh, regarding what are the present practices that you are doing vis-a-vis -vis the COVID era. So it'll just take you five minutes for the survey. It will be in your mailbox uh, by tonight. So please answer that because we have to collate the results. There is another webinar that uh, AIOS is going to do on uh, uh, how do you kind of uh, come back uh, from practice after because now the extension is going to be there most likely. So how do we come back? So that's going to be talking about again the practice management as also the economics uh, and the medical legal. So we have to... Uh, uh, experts from uh, uh, the big seven. So we have uh, one person from Axis Capital, one person from A&M, they are healthcare experts. So they will talk about what they feel about the recession as to how healthcare is going to be in future and as to how eye care is going to be impacted. And then we have a panel of about 12 ophthalmologists who are going to talk about what are their feelings as to what exactly would be the practice patterns, how they will change over time and what uh, ophthalmologists need to do. So that will be from 5.30 to 7.30, uh, day after tomorrow. But the survey will be out to you today. And uh, please uh, take out your time and answer that survey. There are actually two surveys. One IGO is also mailed out and one uh, the AIOS. So maybe you uh, go ahead and uh, look at both the surveys. The IGO is looking at the psychological impact uh, that uh, COVID has had on ophthalmologists. Sorry, uh, go ahead, uh, Gaurav. So, uh, sir, there is a question for uh, mitomycin uh, use in surface ablation. What percentage of mitomycin would you use for sur surface ablation and does it change for the degree of correction that we do? Virinda, would you like to quickly answer that? Yeah. Uh, I use 0.002% mitomycin for all patients, whether it is a small amount of myopia or high amount of myopia. If there is some haze, <laughs> if there is a haze, then I use 0.02%. Otherwise, in all patients, I use 
percent of mitomycin and i apply it for 2 minutes the important thing is that the contact time because if you apply for a very short period then actually what happens the mitomycin does not stay on the surface for its effectivity so my take home is that the mitomycin should be applied in a sufficient time and i applied it as a mirosel sponge so there is a kind of a drop form over the cornea so it is there all over there are okay. some people who so, are using the mitomycin soaked mirosel because of suction the mitomycin remains in contact with the mirosel not with the cornea thanks varinder so there are various protocols i like to just uh, add that uh, you know 0.02% for 12 second <coughs> protocol uh, which many people use and uh, there are other protocols like at lvp that for every diopter they use 10 seconds of uh, mitomycin yeah. uh, there are different protocols and you can look them up and they are all available online uh, there are various for retreatments uh, you would use a uh, longer duration and uh, i think so going on to the next question where there has been many questions actually which are coming in uh, there is another question about dr namrupa that uh, and uh, since you have access to both machines uh, visumax and uh, femtosecond laser would you be worried about flap complications and why you would not although you already summed up why you would not do smile but uh, for a spherical correction and uh, which is a straight forward minus 6 uh, would you why would you still not uh, prefer smile over uh, femtosecond lasik so uh... it does if you look at the economics of course the smile procedure is always more costly as compared to the femtosecond lasik and if the patient is uh, fit for for a smile procedure and patient wants smile procedure and is willing to pay for it then we would go ahead with the smile but if patient if there are economics as a constraint and if the uh, if there is any red flag where you know you wouldn't want to do smile then of course you know uh, you would then uh, do smile only so the poll seems to be you know uh, divided between femto lasik and smile i somehow i see lot more smile for some reason but uh, you know there are also people who are voting in multiple numbers you know the same yeah, so i think smile there are people who have voted 5 5 times i don't know why there are two of them I but know. So uh, i they want to keep smile sorry yes, everybody about the smile dr they rupal has smile. Smile. because smile and the world smiles with you yeah right so there are also more questions about this one very important question from the previous uh, this thing that you know if you are a surgeon who's plan have a high risk patient living with you at home for example your parents or if you have somebody else or you are yourself a high risk you know suppose you have a comorbidity like diabetes or hypertension or cardiac disease for a senior surgeon then would it what caution would you start living separately or how would you do it so this question uh, let's ask dr <laughs> chitra or maybe uh, one of the panelists dr shri ganesh but please be yeah. brief and to the point yeah gaurav i think uh, senior surgeons with comorbidities the recommendation is that they avoid uh, practice until this settles down and uh, so the it is better for them to avoid going either to the opd or the ot especially if you have comorbidities like diabetes or hypertension and if you are over 60 So, so that is a clear advice. Over sixty, so that means myself, Amar, and Dhami are out. <laughs> <laughs> so the young lot wants uh, all the seniors to stop operating. Maybe is that right? So yeah. that's going to be very Keep tough uh, for all of us uh, who are. Anyway, there was another quick question, uh, Shri Ganesh. But if you have your family members uh, with the COVID disease, I think you would isolate them in the house, and uh, you would have to take care of them. <clears> not just, uh, Uh, get them admitted if they don't need admission at all no 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 no, no. the question is no. that if uh, you are exposing yourself to patient should you do self isolation and not come in touch with the senior members of your family I nobody don't. has covid in the family you don't have covid so the question was that if you go and operate should you when you come back what should be the precautions yes. that you should take oh. when you are coming back home yes you i think okay i think i think yeah i uh, think as soon as you come home as soon as you come home it is better to immediately uh, put all your clothes for wash have a hot shower uh, soap down and change of clothes i think that is uh, primarily uh, immediately to be done and no even your uh, hospital bag your laptop bags and your handbags should also be kept in a place far away it's not brought into the house or in some corner of the house we need to but i think we discussed all these points quickly going on harshal wants to his uh, his hand he wants to say something harshal you wanted yeah to yeah Yeah, yeah, Doctor Gaurav. Uh, there was uh, like this discussion was going on in other uh, groups also, sir. Where surgeons are there, so they all agreed that uh, we have to get COVID test done for all the elective surgeries, and some advocated not not one test is enough. Like at the gap of three or four days, you should get 
other test has done. So that is negative. Then only we have to take those patients for elective surgery because the risk of to get the viral load from those asymptomatic patient or who are in carrier stage is very high for the surgeons and anesthetists. So I think we have to get tests done. Now we get the report within one day, the antigen test and rapid test we get within half an hour. So it's important uh, to get- In line with that, Harshul, there has been another question that what about the medical legal issues that if there is an infection either to a patient or to a staff member from a COVID positive asymptomatic patient and there is litigation, then what is the protection from insurance? Dr. Maipa? Yeah, so Gaurav, uh, there was uh, the insurance companies very smartly with effect from 1st of April, they had changed the uh, cover for the professional indemnity and they had said that they will not indemnify because if there is any transmission, whether viral, bacterial or fungal. So that is, uh, that actually would tantamount even for not them uh, giving them uh, uh, professional indemnity for even endophthalmitis or something like that uh, post-surgery. So uh, we sprung into action and uh, I think uh, we wish to thank uh, uh, Dr. Uh, V.K. Paul, Member Planning Commission and uh, the uh, Health Minister. They have reversed it pretty soon. Uh, so uh, just now the professional indemnity will cover uh, for uh, COVID transmission in your hospital if it goes to a patient, etc. But I think the consent form, I'll ask Namrata to again send it out uh, that we are taking from every patient once the patient is entering the premises, that uh, uh, we uh, that we it's a kind of an indemnification that we take from the patient. That in case uh, uh, you are coming in for an emergency surgery or a normal surgery, and in case you get uh, a COVID infection, you will not hold the hospital liable. So I think it is safe. Uh, it's better to keep this consent form signed from every patient plus the attendant because it can be a two-way two-way transmission that can be there. So just now. Uh, uh, you cannot stop anybody from putting in a legal suit. Uh, obviously, I think there'll be there is one legal suit that came about in uh, Bikaner. Somebody said that an FIR Bilwada. should be. Huh? Bilwada. Bilwada, yeah. Sorry, uh, Bilwada, that uh, the doctor uh, was negligent and uh, it led to spread. So I don't think the FIR has been lodged, but it was a law student who said that. So you can't stop anybody from doing that. But whatever maximum uh, precautions you need to take, you take that and just carrying on uh, from where you, uh, the question was, where Shri Ganesh was saying, ideally you should have a separate shirt or a separate set of clothes that you should wear when you are in the hospital, take them out and leave them in the hospital. And when you come back home, you should ring up uh, your home that they should keep the door open so that you don't uh, work on the doorknobs, etc. There should be a bucket there and there should be soap outside so that you wash your hands, etc., etc. And then go straight away for a warm shower. And some people are, uh, I have friends in US who go and do gargling uh, for with hot water uh, when they come back. These are the frontliners who are at the ICU. And they have kept their parents at a separate place. And ideally, if you are doing the ICU, you should be in a separate uh, room, etc. So these are a couple of the things that people have come about uh, in due course of time that uh, you should not wear anything uh, which is the same for home as also for the hospital. Thanks, sir. There was Michael, a Michael, what about the, the vehicle in which we travel? The, the vehicle, vehicle in can be something that is there, but uh, obviously the, there the chances can be. So what they say is when you're getting out of the hospital, you come in a different set of clothes. Within the hospital, you have a different set. So you can actually wear a different shirt, change into a different sh uh, shirt and scrubs, etc. Yes. And the point is that you should give four sets of scrubs et cetera, uh, to a person so that it's, uh, and if you have surgeons coming in every third day for the OT, so it will be more than 10, 12 days and you should dry them up. Now the summers are coming up, so you should have them uh, uh, put on the terrace or someplace so that they are dried up and uh, uh, they should be adequately washed. So those are the things that uh, have to be done. There are these sanitizer uh, cabins that are being sold now, but uh, with the uh, hypochlorite solution, I think. So that can also be done, but I'm not sure. There are a lot of reports that are coming. The recommendation give a is... false sense of security. Yes. So one really doesn't know, but these are cabins also that are coming up when you can uh, go into the hospital, you should work. So the recommendation cabins. is withdrawn for those cabins now because they'll give you a false sense of security that, uh, you know, you might get disinfected. So yeah. the government guideline now is that not to do that, actually. Uh, I was reading a circular yesterday or day before. Yeah, I school. also read, but uh, Gaurav, I don't think there's any harm. That's just an additional thing. It's not that if you have gone through it, it's absolutely fine. You should still get the temperature testing done. Uh, plus the uh, uh, questionnaire uh, that AIOS has circulated also regarding 
history now travel history may be obsolete but then the point is have you come in touch with somebody have you running fever etc etc namrata wants to say something to raise a hand so i just want to say that uh, regarding the self declaration form which sir was mentioning we are getting it translated into various languages now and uh, very soon we will uh, circulate that as well and uh, regarding that tunnel which you are uh, again mentioning we do have it at aims also but uh, it is being used although the circular is was there that uh, it should not be used and it it could be counter productive as well so these are the only two things which i want to i think uh, we've had a very productive session we've already run uh, almost uh, two hours now so i would i think uh, it's time that we wind up i'd like to make quick two announcements first of all i would like to thank all our panelists in here today right from the beginning of the session and uh, all our uh, participants and people who, who were uh, presenting all our top faculty who presented and all the audience who sent in almost 2000 questions and uh, so this webinar will be available ready to see on our facebook page on irsi uh, which where it was already live the link is going to remain you can go back and see the whole webinar it will also come up tomorrow on our uh, youtube uh, irsi page and you can see the recording there if you prefer to see it on youtube and we will be back with you on the 16th at 5 pm and uh, any last passing comments final comments from the president uh, irsi dr dhami would you like to uh, say anything to close this i would like to thank everybody before we sign off Excellent. Just a question: What is there on 16th? We are coming back tomorrow. Sir, there is an IRSA webinar also planned again for 16th. J N J just gave confirmation. The program is not finalized yet. I will be sharing it with you tomorrow tomorrow morning. Okay. This is different okay. from the one which you are doing tomorrow. Yes. Okay. Tomorrow is A I U S I S R S and uh, I R S I. I would like to just I congratulate Gaurav for all this work which you have done. Gaurav, yeah. it's fantastic because you have really put the whole show together. Congrats. Thank, Thank you so much. Let's all clap together. Yes. Excellent, yes. Gaurav. Thank, 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 thank you, Gaurav. Thank, thank you so much. Thank you, Gaurav. Uh, well thank think you so much. Every, everybody was part of it. Thank you so much. And I think with that we can uh, all uh, you know uh, sign off. And thanks to all the audience who was uh, with us uh, till the end. Almost two thousand five hundred people logged in on Swanim, and we had another uh, couple of hundred on uh, Facebook. So I think uh, uh, I hope you found it useful. Thank you so much for everybody. Also, here. we would like to thank J N J and the person who does uh, the webinar, Mr. Gaurav. and mr sundar for lot of hard work yeah because yeah. they coordinated really well it's not easy to coordinate so many people from so many different uh, places in such a professional manner jnj has been really forthcoming they agreed at 3 uh, days notice to you know organize everything for us uh, they've already been doing for india wow. us so thanks are due to them as well and now and now they have agreed for one day notice also or <laughs> 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 no i think it's a big uh, uh, help from jnj and uh, thank you so much to everybody thank you. thanks dr sodu thanks dr thank kumar dr pratha dr chitra dr amar sir thank, thank you. you for being here dr mai dr dami uh, all of you i hope i've not missed anyone dr virinder thank you so much all of you and see you missed gaurav you missed gaurav thank, thank, thank you gaurav thanks sir miss me gaurav no, no. thanks dr rupal i'm so sorry thank you you missed me too with the biggest no. smile thank you thanks thanks but thanks a lot for Uh, she is missing us. the smile sergeants it was really nice got thank the highest smile yes thanks thank you mypal sir thank you amar thank you gaurav thank, 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 thank you thank you gaurav thank you stay safe yeah stay at least safe